Odysseus has landed. For the first time since 1972, an American-made spacecraft safely touched down on the surface of the moon. What we can confirm, without a doubt, is our equipment is on the surface of the moon and we are transmitting. What this historic moment means for both NASA and the commercialization of the moon. Rockets on display. In another first, Blue Origin rolled out a fully integrated pathfinder for its new New Glenn rocket. Now Jeff Bezos' rocket company is preparing to challenge Elon Musk and SpaceX in the launch arena. Return to sender. After eight months on orbit, the first spacecraft designed to manufacture pharmaceutical drugs is now back on Earth. The achievement shared by two U.S. space companies. And stacking up, United Launch Alliance, NASA, and Boeing are gearing up to launch the first Starliner spacecraft with astronauts on board. The preparations for the long-awaited crewed flight test. Joining us for insight and analysis are Tim Fernholtz, senior space reporter at Payload Space, and Micah Maidenberg, a reporter covering space for the Wall Street Journal. From the Space Flight Now News Bureau at NASA's Kennedy Space Center, this is News from the Press Site. And liftoff of Artemis 1, we rise together back to the moon and beyond. on board the International Space Station. And this time, go Falcon, go Dragon, go Group F. This allows us to go faster and to have better technology. When we start putting humans on that vehicle, the excitement is even going to amp up even more. Thanks for taking the time to answer our questions. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of News from the Press Site. I'm Robinson Smith, reporter for Space Flight Now. Thank you so much for taking part of your day to be with us as we round up yet another very busy week on the space front. We've got moon landings, new rockets, newly stacked rockets, lots to talk about. And we have a wonderful panel that we'll be bringing in in just a moment. But before we do, a bit of housekeeping at the top of the program. If you haven't already, be sure to hit the like button below and share the stream so more folks can find this live and robust conversation as we continue on for the next 45 minutes discussing space news. And also, we do have our live chat running. We have our Stephen Young, editor here at Space Flight Now, and Adam Bernstein, our astute photographer, that are going to be monitoring the live chat and keeping an eye out for good comments or questions. So if you have something on your mind regarding some of our stories that we're going to be talking about, either for myself or for our panel guests, be sure to put that in the chat and we'll address it during the social break coming up in just a little bit. So with all that housekeeping out of the way, wanna go ahead and bring in our panelists. First up, we have Tim Fernholtz, who is a senior reporter at Payload Space. He's also a freelance journalist and the author of the book, Rocket Billionaires, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and the New Space Race. Tim, welcome to the show. Pleasure to be here. Glad to have you. And our other panelist is Michael Maidenberg, He's a reporter for the Wall Street Journal who covers space. He also completed an investigative reporting fellowship during his time at Columbia, wears a lot of hats, and we're happy to have him here as well on News in the Press site. Micah, welcome aboard. Thanks, Will. Well, gentlemen, we have a, a lot to discuss as we just uh, played in the cold opening. And of course, the story that's on all of our minds right now, the Odyssey of Odysseus. I want to get started with this. We can go to our uh, first video here, guys, in the back. We're a company that uh, defy the impossible. And I think I'm just so proud of everybody here downstairs. I think they're still cheering and crying. And up here, all you guests to share this with us. The world is pulling for us. We yes. felt it. So now we're on the surface. Our engine performed brilliantly. Our plucky lander, Odie, performed brilliantly. Woo! 
um, I think the future is really bright, and you can sense that the whole world is behind this. It's been on every TV uh, channel. It's just been amazing. And that amazing feat, as described by Intuitive Machine CEO Steve Altimus, of course, was the landing of ODI, the name of their Nova Sea lander on the moon, last evening at about 6.34 or so, 6.32, uh, marking the first time a commercial lander was able to set foot safely on the moon. Still waiting for some more details about, you know, exactly what happened, but there's a lot to unpack from what we do know, so I want to bring in the panel here. Everyone, of course, was, as uh, Steve mentioned, glued to their TVs as we were glued to our live stream, gentlemen. So, uh, Tim, want to start with you and then we'll go to Micah. Just first off, thoughts on just the moment that we all witnessed last night and the fact that now we have, in addition to a handful of nation states that have safely put spacecraft on the moon, you can add Intuitive Machines as the first company. Yes, huge news. It's uh, it's the first wave of the Artemis program. You know, we're about to see something on the order of 90 private missions to the moon is, I think, the last total. This is the, I think, fourth attempt in the last five years or so. So it's about to really increase. Um, I would say we need to, we are all waiting on the edge of our seats for a press conference that's coming up right after this program that Intuitive Machines is doing. Uh, right now, we know, uh, according to the company, that the lander is on the moon, that it is transmitting data back. Uh, I think we're all waiting to see how upright it is, what the other sensors and scientific payloads are doing. Um, but it is a major success. Keep in mind, Intuitive Machines has two more missions planned, probably going to do a few more. And the fact that their propulsion system worked in space, maneuvered the vehicle into orbit, and brought it down pretty close to the planet or the moon, I should say, is, is a big deal for the first try. We saw Astrobotic, another U.S. company, didn't even make it to the moon because of some issues with their propulsion system. Um, so it's very exciting. I think we want to see just a little bit more about the status of the vehicle, um, but it is the first step of what is going to be a ton of new lunar activity. And Mike, I want to pick up on one of the points Tim just made there about the propulsion system. Uh, both uh, Trent Martin and Steve Altimus have been very out in front talking about their confidence in the propulsion system. But as you can see uh, right there, some of the video of a work being done by uh, some folks on the Intuitive Machines Nova Sea Lander. Um, you've been covering NASA for years now. Talk about the sort of milestone that this methane, uh, liquid methane and liquid oxygen propulsion system, you know, provided and was able to prove out. Sure. Well, I, I mean, one milestone that I, I maybe I could just mention really quickly is just for the the model, right? The structure of how of of how NASA and you know the company Intuitive Machines kind of collaborated to get you know this uh, lander down to the surface. I mean, Intuitive Machines pulled it off. Um, it's it just strikes me as like a a big moment for this kind of theory at NASA this to to offload stuff that the commercial industry, you know, commercial companies are ready to take on to them. Um we've seen that with you know crew and cargo with launches and this is a big step for the moon. Um and on all the missions that that are are planned. Um yeah, I mean in, in part of like what uh intuitive machines had to do of course is like figure out how to crunch down a, a moon landing uh, to get out there and get landed um, on a, a, a much tighter timeline and with out that kind of expansive government funding that you might have seen, you know, in decades past. And I think, you know, developing that propulsion technology and taking some risks there to to see to to prove it out, um, you know, it appears to have paid off, you know, for the company, you know, with this operation. Yeah, and, and as you see, obviously, next to your image there, Micah, um, you know, some investors, I'm sure, very happy, as we've seen the, the stock value of Intuitive Machines climb throughout the day. It was volatile throughout the week as we were all, you know, on pins and needles to see if it was going to land, what it was going to look like. Um, but actually, seeing on the surface, I'm sure a lot of folks that have some financial stake in Intuitive Machines are, are very happy today. Bring me back in, uh, Tim, you mentioned that this is the the first of a number of missions lined up for Intuitive Machines, including one coming up in the fourth quarter is what they're planning for. Um, you know, in learning more as we hope to through this press conference this afternoon, what sort of things are you and, you know, our, our other colleagues on the space beat, you know, 
really most keenly wanting to know and understand about, you know, how this all went down, literally and figuratively. Yeah, you know, I spoke with yep. um, Chris Colbert, who's the manager for the CLIPS program, which is NASA's uh, organization that is hiring these private companies to go to the moon. Uh, and just to address something that Micah said, when I talked to Colbert, he said, you know, four or five years ago, if you had asked him, you know, are there private organizations that could make a moon lander? He would have said no. And now we have NASA has tapped 14 companies. I think several of them are out of business, but let's say a dozen companies that are probably capable of building a moon lander and at least four American companies that have real contracts to do so. Uh, and that is that is really exciting. Uh, when it comes to this press conference, I think what we want to know most is and what Colbert wanted to see from this mission is can you land softly on the moon in the right attitude so that your sensors can work and how close were they to their target area they were trying to land in a specific crater near the south pole of the moon and really what they were trying to prove is that their autonomous navigation system is capable of doing that there are interesting scientific payloads on this lander but NASA consciously you know said we're not sending our most exquisite and important instruments on this one that's coming up in the future uh, so I think that's what everyone is trying to hear. And I, and I think we should mention, because it is pretty wild, uh, what happened during the landing uh, yesterday. There were some back and forth about the time. And during the Intuitive Machines live stream, they kind of slipped it in slightly that they had taken an extra orbit around the moon because their laser rangefinder sensors that were going to tell them basically the altitude of the spacecraft as it descended had failed. And instead, they patched in an experimental NASA LIDAR sensor that was on the vehicle. And if you talk to a software engineer, if you talk to an aerospace engineer about plugging a new sensor into a guidance and navigation system without testing it while in spaceflight conditions, I mean, that's, that's an incredible accomplishment of the engineers there. And it speaks to kind of the energy of this public-private partnership, which is you know, that kind of switch is something probably a NASA mission would would not have done, would not have taken that risk, but they're able to build on what the space agency could give them. So it was pretty incredible. Yeah, Micah, to that point, um, you know, the instrument that Tim was referencing, the navigation Doppler LIDAR, you know, it was built in as a part of Astrobotics Peregrine Lander. Obviously, it's a part of Intuitive Machines Nova Sea Lander. Um, I don't actually know if it's part of Firefly's Blue Ghost, but given that they're next up to bat, I believe, um, you know, um, as far as the CLIPS program missions, the commercial lunar payload services, do you think that, you know, all of these landers should have that as a, a fallback? Or, you know, how much pressure does this really put on, on Firefly if it doesn't have that instrument to make sure it has all of its T's crossed and I's dotted? That's it's a really good question. I mean, I don't know if I'm I'm positioned to to say, you know, that Blue Ghost should have one particular piece of technology or, or another on it. Um, but it, I, I think it's fair to say that you know, for Firefly and and everybody that's going after, right, this mission last night is going to be learning, absorbing, like thinking about what happened and trying to map out how they can take, you know, the lessons learned the real-time adjustment, the the work on the fly, um, and incorporate that into their vehicles, into their mission planning. So, you know, I, I think it's, you know, what we saw will sort of ripple out and, and affect, you know, what the, the folks that are coming next. And, you know, as we round up this discussion on IM1, you know, looking forward to the future, you know, NASA officials such as uh, Dr. Nicola Fox have said, you know, we're more comfortable with uh, not complete success with Eclipse program overall. Right now, they're batting 500 with taking in a loss on Astrobotics Peregrine. They succeeded with IM1. You know, question to the both of you. We'll start with Tim and then go to Micah. Um, but how do you think, and I'm sure this question will come up during the press conference, but how do you think NASA is sort of taking this all in as, you know, now they've achieved that, you know, 50% success rate that they were hoping for? recognizing that we're only, you know, two missions in. Well, I think they'll be pretty excited about it. Um, the thing about the CLIPS program, you know, it is part of a lineage of other efforts that we have mentioned here to work with private companies to do cargo missions to the space station, crewed missions. 
out to like moon landers that SpaceX and Blue Origin are building for astronauts. And the CLIPS program, uh, you know, the way Colbert described it, you know, when NASA buys a pencil, they don't really ask anything about how the pencil is made. They just take it off the shelf. And the CLIPS program is about as close to that as you can get when you're building spacecraft. NASA does not really have a lot of insight or direction over what they're doing. And so the fact that they are getting so far a 50% success rate is, is pretty good. And we can probably hope for better, but there's going to be, you know, a lot more missions uh, coming from this. And, you know, I was doing a little math yesterday. I think there were seven uh, surveyor landers ahead of the Apollo missions, and those cost about $4.2 billion in today's money. Uh, and the CLIPS program has, I think, $2.6 billion that it's spending. I think it's going to send more spacecraft. We'll see if more survive. Um, but I think we are seeing the cost of this kind of access to the moon going down, and that's really the name of the game for NASA. Um, but it's going to be up to their scientists at the end of the day to say, do we have enough of the information we want to really say this program was a success? And Mike, a final word to you on this before we move on. Um, you know, some of the the more important yeah. NASA payloads are, are coming up like their, you know, very expensive Viper rover that's supposed to launch on Astrobotic's second mission at the end of the year. Do you think we may see some some shakeup there? Or do you think now that they have a, a clip success that there may be more surety about some of these upcoming missions? I, I think this is a win for NASA, for the model, for for certainly intuitive machines and sort of the the you know, how this program is being set up. And I think, you know, NASA, the industry also has other constituencies, right, to to kind of think about with regards to CLIPS and its future, uh, namely Congress, you know, the purse strings, how the budget plays out. So, um, you know, look, the messaging from NASA has always been, this is about shots on goal. And, you know, I think the agency, um, you know, was happy clearly to have one that went in, you know, last night. <laughs> Yeah, just based off some of the the video we saw of people cheering and you know uh, celebrating, I, I'm sure some of them were saying "go," <laughs> and very much uh, you know celebrating this this final win for them, first of hopefully many. Well, speaking of first, want to go on to our next topic here in the realm of first opportunities. Blue Origin happened to bring out its first fully integrated Pathfinder rocket. This of course, is something that we've been waiting to see for some time. They raised it up vertically up at the pad at Launch Complex 36 over at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, seeing some images here uh, next to me of the rollout process and what it was like. It was something that, you know, has been hoped for by a lot of folks and obviously is going to be a pretty big player. It was what Blue Origin is hoping for on the launch landscape. So, bringing you gentlemen back in to break this down in further detail, because obviously they've got, you know, some important NASA missions that are on deck as well as they're hoping to compete in the national security realm. So Mike, I want to uh, start with you on this one, you know, given that blue origin, you know, very much says that they believe that they're able to launch for the first time this year. How important was it that we're now finally seeing their pathfinder rocket at the pad? Very important. But clearly a long time coming. Um, you know, a blue origin is a, a diversified space company in a lot of ways. You know, they're they have they're building, as Tim mentioned earlier, the, the lunar lander. Um, they have an orbital transfer vehicle they're working on. Um, and other, you know, other other kind of projects are percolating over there. But but new certainly New Shepherd, but New Glenn is sort of a thread that cuts through a number of those programs. Um, and I think, you know, getting this, you know, vehicle moving is is just a really big deal and something that a lot of a lot of folks, you know, in and out of the company in and in and outside of NASA are are watching really closely. Um, you know, assuming the launch, uh, the first launch happens this year, um, it seems to me like it's going to be one of the, the bigger kind of first launches for bigger space events, you know, potentially of 2024. Absolutely. And, and Tim, as the author of Rocket Billionaires, you know a thing or two about Blue Origin and their aspirations. So want to bring you in here next. Um, you know, Jeff Bezos, you know, spoke a little bit earlier this year about their ambitions for Blue Origin and, you know, their hopes to compete with SpaceX and ULA, for that matter, as it stands now in the national security realm. So 
what are you kind of watching for with this first year of new Glenn flights? And, you know, what are their prospects in competing for some of those national security launch contract missions? Well, it's all about execution. Uh, and that has been the devil for Blue Origin for many years now. They have been the big hope for someone who will, for another company that can compete with SpaceX and actually build reusable rockets. Um, but, you know, Blue Origin has not flown New Shepard in some time now. It has not flown anything in some time now. Uh, they just had a major reorganization. They have a new CEO, Dave Limp, who came from Amazon. He used to be the head of Amazon's device division. He does not have an aerospace background, but he does have the trust of Jeff Bezos. Uh, so it's going to be a big test if Limp can get this organization functioning to deliver a rocket to the pad, to launch it, and to pass the certification process for those national security contracts. And then the other thing that we should mention is it's been reported in a number of places, but not confirmed, that Blue Origin may very well purchase ULA uh, and its rocket company. And that would be a huge shakeup and also a major challenge of integrating two formerly competing companies, although they have a partnership sharing engines. Uh, so, I mean, it's pivotal the next 12 months what Blue Origin does for the future of spaceflight in the United States, and you could say the world, because it's going to affect how SpaceX prices their rockets and the sort of potential for bigger collaborations, you know, in low Earth orbit. Blue Origin wants to build a space station there. It's not going to happen if the New Glenn isn't functioning. They want to do a moon lander for NASA. That's not going to happen if New Glenn isn't working. So everything really hangs on it. And the fact that they got it standing up at the pad is exciting, but they got to get it to orbit. Yeah, and Micah, you spent a good chunk of the back end of your week up at the FAA's Commercial Space Conference. You know, obviously a lot of conversation about a number of different rockets and, and functions and, you know, uh, licenses and reentry licenses. We'll talk about reentry licenses in a second with another story. But what was kind of the overall thought and impression of Blue Origin, you know, in that arena? You know, I, I don't, the, right, this, uh, I don't know, I don't think Blue Origin had a, a like a specific, um, there wasn't like a specific like blue origin, you know, angle, I suppose, to the um, the FAA conference. It was there was a lot of discussion this year uh, about uh, part 450, you know, this regime to sort of license launches and bring, you know, you know, do reentries um, and how to make it better, how to how to improve upon it to, um, you know, facilitate more operations. I mean, I guess that one way to think about just sort of Blue Origin, but also a lot of other launchers is, you know, the industry is really thinking about this hard and concerned. Folks at the FAA are thinking about this and are working on it too. Um, if, for the next few years when, you know, the launch cadence is expected to pick up from, you know, several companies, SpaceX, of course, uh, launches a lot. They have plans to do more. Blue Origin would clearly like to, you know, ramp up its sort of pace of operations as well. Stoke, there's others. So, you know, it's like that launch licensing regime and the FAA's ability to sort of process the applications. I, you know, it's it's something that the industry is thinking about quite a bit. Sorry, I, I kind of went off on a tangent there, but that's yeah. Does that make sense? <laughs> no, absolutely. And you know, we're we're online. We can go on tangents. It's all right. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> We don't have hard outs and commercial breaks, so we we have the the floor to talk about these things at length. Okay. But it's the whole point of the podcast. So, uh, want to go back to something you brought up, Tim, um, the potential sale of ULA and New or uh, Blue Origin as what has uh, been described as probably the likely buyer in this scenario. If that all comes to pass, how much of a increased player does that make Blue Origin? against something like SpaceX when you add a Vulcan rocket and the remaining Atlas Vs that are still on their uh, roster to that list. Uh, granted, you know, all the Atlas Vs are purchased and, and booked at this point, so it's not like you're adding additional launch capability, but you do add, you know, a, a company that has, you know, 100% success as ULA is. Um, so you have a, a reputation, I suppose, that's added to it. But what do you think is the additional value if ULA is brought under a Blue Origin umbrella? That's a really interesting question. I mean, hypothetically, we're going from three American companies with heavy lift rockets to two, uh, which might not be, uh, you know, smiled upon by regulators. 
Um, but it would mean, you know, Blue Origin would have a functioning rocket that it could use that could give it more time to develop new blend to be fully reusable, which is a goal of Bezos's. But it's it's sort of a crazy question. And when you talk to industry analysts about like combining a Blue Origin and a ULA, there's a lot of big questions and costs. You know, cost synergies are not obvious when you have, I mean, obviously they share an engine, the two main vehicles here, but it's ULA is a sprawling operation that is sort of designed for, you know, major defense contracts. You know, it's it's like a big pickle and it's going to be interesting to see the decisions that Blue Origin makes if they do acquire the company. Uh, I would be loath to, to speculate about it, um, but I mean, you know, maybe it would streamline things at, at the FAA. Um, but it is interesting. I just wanted to talk about the, you know, the regulations that Micah was talking about. You know, the reason that they were reformed was sort of because of the experience of certifying SpaceX's reusable rocket. So one thing to watch is going to be how Blue Origin's experience certifying its reusable rocket goes under the reforms. I think it's sort of a case where the industry is the dog that caught the car. They asked for a lot more flexibility on the kinds of vehicles they could get licenses for, but now they have to provide a huge amount of technical analysis to the FAA, which now has to process it, and it's taken a lot longer than everyone thinks. And so that is one of the reasons we're seeing both industry and the, the FAA sort of say, okay, we gotta, we gotta rethink this. And whatever happens, Blue Origin will certainly, and its lobbyists will be at the center of that discussion. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating to watch over the next several months and years. And, you know, I'm sure there'll, there will be discussions to be had about the the elimination of another heavy launch provider. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't know if the term, you know, monopoly necessarily would apply in this situation, but you think of, you know, maybe a, a similar analogy with the, the large carriers and you had Sprint and T-Mobile and then you lost Sprint and it folded under T-Mobile and now you've kind of got the big three and, you know, some smaller players running around like Mint Mobile. But we'll we'll see if, you know, <laughs> that analogy actually comes to bear with with this one here. Um, going to continue on with our, our next topic and just uh, remind folks, if you're watching this live, first off, welcome aboard. Uh, just a, a point in time. This is news from the press site our weekly roundup on all the week's news uh, on the space beat. Will Robinson Smith joined by our wonderful panelists, Micah Maidenberg with the Wall Street Journal and Tim Fernolds with Payload Space, and also a freelance writer as well. We're gonna come back to our panel discussion in just a moment, but first wanna go ahead and touch on some of the launches that we've seen this week as it has been another busy week on the launch front. So if we can bring in those slides and run through them pretty quickly. Um, of course, we had an Electron rocket launch from down in New Zealand. This one was called On Closer Inspection. This was an interesting one, launched for Astroscale. It'll be sending a spacecraft to examine uh, an old discarded rocket body up close. And so that mission will take place over the next several months, uh, Pathfinder, if you will, to the process of potentially deorbiting some of this space debris and cleaning up some of the low Earth orbit environment. Continuing on, we also saw a launch from India. This was a launch of their GSLV-F14 rocket. This was their second flight of the year. This was a, a weather satellite that launched earlier this week. Moving on. Falcon 9 rocket with an Indonesian uh, satellite, communication satellite, Meraputa 2. This was the second time that SpaceX has launched a satellite for this particular company. First one coming back in 2018. This Falcon 9 lifting off from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Moving on. Another Falcon 9 just last night. If you were here on the channel, you saw the coverage of the Starlink 7-15 mission. Sending up 22 Starlink satellites and uh, SpaceX actually just announcing a deal with the Bahamas for being able to land their Falcon 9 first stage boosters off those shores. So a bit of a, a tourist attraction for East Coast launches. Moving on. And that'll wrap it up for the slides, although I do know that there was at least one other one that we didn't get to. Japan's H3 rocket had its return to flight mission, a big milestone for them and hydrogen powered vehicles. So bringing the panel back in to talk about this for just a little bit here. Uh, obviously we've all done extensive reporting on SpaceX and Starlink. And so wanna kind of touch on that there to the two of you gentlemen. Um, 
Tim, I'll go to you first. You know, given the proliferation of of Starlink satellites, you know, this this new tourism contract that was just announced, kind of give me your overall impression of where SpaceX is with this, you know, more than 5,800, I believe, satellites launched at this point. I mean, Starlink is changing the the satellite communications industry. Uh, it's forcing everybody to react. It's forcing consolidation. I think sort of, and it's clearly been a success for SpaceX, at least thus far, in terms of generating cash to fuel the company. I think everyone is waiting to see if they do, in fact, try and spin it out uh, as its own uh, publicly traded firm. Uh, I, I think that may be more complicated maybe than than some people anticipate. Uh, but the other thing to watch is, you know, a couple of years ago, Elon Musk said that if they couldn't get Starship flying and launching new larger Starlink satellites, they were going to go bankrupt. And threatening to go bankrupt is a classic Elon Musk motivation tactic. But we are now starting to approach the point where SpaceX is going to have to refresh its uh, constellation. It wants to do direct to mobile um, to regular cell phone transmissions with T-Mobile. It wants to have optical laser links on all its satellites. And so the new Starlink version 2 uh, is quite a bit larger than the original spacecraft. And so my question about the future of Starlink is how long will it take them to refresh the satellite? constellation with these new spacecraft. And that's really a question of how long will it take them to be flying Starship regularly. Uh, and I'm not, I think there is some risk there and it's going to be interesting to see how that all plays out. Yeah, the the Starship question is one they're all equally watching, of course, the, the next time we're going to need to be down in southern Texas to see that fly. And of course, everyone at SpaceX hoping that it achieves its full flight path there and uh, possibly with a, a payload on board, We've seen some video of them testing the uh, payload door on the ship upper stage. Mike, I want to uh, turn it to you now. You've done some recent reporting on Starlink and uh, their partnership with Deer. And, you know, for those in the agriculture community and business sector, big deal that partnership, bringing that kind of capability, be able to be embedded in a bunch of farming and ag equipment. So, what did your reporting tell us about, you know, sort of that side of SpaceX's, uh, I guess, permutation into the larger economy? Yeah, I, I thought this deal was was really interesting. Um, one, because it was a, just a, a, a crystal clear example of like a really big company, like like f realizing it had a need, right, for to and, and figuring out that SATCOM was like the way to go. Um, I'm I'm always wondering kind of how other companies, uh, big and small, will sort of map on more or less to you know space capabilities for for their own you know ends you know back here on Earth. So just sort of very broadly, like it kind of intrigued me. That was one thing that intrigued me about the Deer deal. Um, it you know the agreement showed. Um, when my colleague who who at the journal who covers deer sort of did an interview with one of their their leaders and you know he said like one of the things that was really um distinct or interesting to them about SpaceX and, and Starlink, you know, for this agreement was the company's ability, basically kind of that vertical integration kind of component that we, you know, a lot of us have talked about over over time. You know, they said the SpaceX's ability to make its own satellite, launch them with its own rockets, you know, was, you know, a, a distinguishing characteristic and something that, you know, dear valued in thinking about um, buying this capacity for these, you know, all of these like ag pieces, pieces of ag equipment all over the world. So um, I just thought that was like really interesting to hear from, you know, a, a big customer like Deer that they also found that 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 to be a a compelling proposition, you know, from SpaceX, the way they kind of set up these, you know, both sat and uh, rocket launch uh, manufacturing and, and sorry, and launching. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and, and certainly we've seen more overtures. I think I think it was Hawaiian Airlines just announced a partnership with with Starlink, and I'm sure more airlines and uh, shipping companies are are going to be coming on board. As you know, as as you just said, it's it's a very enticing business model, and I'm curious to see. Um, Tim, I'll, I'll give you the last word on this before we move on. Just you know what the the larger you know low Earth orbit uh, communication market starts to look like between you know 
OneWeb and some of the other competitors, obviously Amazon's Project Hyper hoping to be, you know, a player in all this, you know, how the market kind of shakes out in a few years once, you know, you've got more of these mega constellations that are really integrated in the marketplace. I think we're, I mean, I, I was really excited about that John Deere story because it is the promise of all of the investment we're seeing in the space world in the last decade is that this is more important than just launching, you know, scientific spacecraft and the small market for space activity. The name of the game is the stuff we're doing in space is going to add so much value that the world's largest tractor manufacturer has to buy it. Um, and, you know, we published a chart at Payload uh, maybe last week from the uh, the researchers at Euroconsult, which is a, a market research organization. And it was basically the cost of building uh, network capacity in space. And it was a line that went from the top and it went down, uh, you know, 77%, I think, decrease in the cost of space data, mainly because of Starlink. And when you think about Starlink, you know, it doesn't have a monopoly on space communication, but it is the only, you know, NGSO large swarm satellite that can do it. OneWeb is starting to compete. Kuiper, as you say, from Amazon will come online, but also China is launching uh, more than one large swarming constellation. And what that hopefully means is that the cost of data gets cheaper. Um, and that would be, you know, a marginal improvement on life at Earth. But the adoption, the widespread adoption of satellite communications would be a huge step forward in the space economy and, and technology towards, you know, the scientific future that Elon Musk loves to talk about. Well, and, and speaking of, of steps forward, certainly one of the other big news items of the week was the return of Varda's Winnebago One or Winnie One that we saw uh, just about a day or so ago, a couple days ago, if we can go to this video here, this was the capsule as it separated from uh, its SpaceX ride about eight months ago. It spent a long time on orbit. This video here showing the re-entry and that little dot that you see there going towards the top of your screen, that's actually Rocket Lab's Photon, which was playing host to the capsule as it made its way on orbit. And before it separated, it gave it a couple of propulsive kicks towards what you see here on your screen now, the return of the capsule and the Utah desert, the uh, army installation that was also host to the return of the OSIRIS-REx sample that uh, came back with, from asteroid Bennu last September. So we've seen a couple of interesting capsule returns here. These photos taken by a uh, friend of the, the podcast here, John Kraus in partnership with Varda. So bringing the, the panel back in, you know, one of the things that Varda Space Industries really wanted to be able to prove out was that it could host, you know, a facility where they could manufacture and, and process uh, pharmaceutical drugs and then bring them back safely. The fact that they a, did that, obviously, we're still waiting for some more data on, you know, how safe they were returned. But the fact they were also able to get a Part 450 reentry license from the FAA. Start with you, Micah, since you just came from the FAA conference. How big of a deal is this? Very big deal. Um, you, you know, I, one of the things that was discussed a little bit at the conference this week was, um, you know, that like the time is now to start like ironing out these regulations because the the expected activity, it's not, you know, it's happening right now. <laughs> you know, it's not just a hypothetical five years away. Um, so I think I think like that sort of regu, you know. Varda getting through sort of the licensing process for the first time, um, you know, a big deal, something to watch. Um, the industry wants to, of course, keep ironing out and the FAA, they're going to be working together to sort of uh, continue to change and, and iron out the the licensing. Um, and I guess I just also wanted to mention, you know, to Tim's point just a moment ago, you know, th this is um, a potential, you know, new use case for low earth orbit, right? Um, we talk a lot about SATCOM, you know, a, a while ago, there we used to talk about satellite television. It's like, what are the the business cases in LEO that that we're going to pay for down on Earth and use on Earth? And SATCOM is certainly like a big one, uh, maybe pharmaceutical research, biotech, you know, stuff in, in space and different modes um, will be the next. I mean, I think there's a lot of discussion about that right now. And Varda is very much in the mix there. Yeah, I'll, Tim, give you the the last word here on this before we move on, as we're 
unfortunately starting to run short on time and I want to make sure we get to our last story as well, but don't want to loop you out of this part of the conversation. No, I think I think Micah summed it up well. And it's, you know, it's not just Varda here. I think, you know, we have a couple of different companies that are trying to build space stations in low Earth orbit to succeed the ISS, and they are going to need to make money. And if, in fact, you can use microgravity to make unique drugs or unique technical components, that is a long way towards making that a reality. So it's very exciting to see these proofs of concept and there's a long way ahead in terms of like a high cadence of this and efficient regulations and all that. But it's it's very cool to be bringing back drugs from space. And proof of concept is a great way to segue to our final story. Thank you for that, Tim. Um, earlier this week, we also saw the stacking of what's poised to be the 100th launch of an Atlas V rocket over at Slick 41, Space Launch Complex 41 over at the Cape. This one in preparation to launch Boeing's Starliner spacecraft for the first time with astronauts on board, something that was or is, has been long awaited by a lot of folks, certainly NASA and all of its partners to get uh, another compliment to SpaceX and its Dragon spacecraft to shuttle astronauts to and from the ISS taking a look at some video here of the Starliner spacecraft from an earlier stacking for one of their orbital test flights without crew. So bringing the, the panel back in as we round out our discussion this afternoon, you know, Boeing, ULA, NASA, they've all been, you know, wanting this moment to come for a long time. It seemed like, you know, in an alternate timeline, Boeing was flying astronauts before SpaceX, but as it plays out, you know, here we are about to receive the eighth crew rotation cadre of astronauts flying aboard a SpaceX Dragon, you know, just set the stage for us. You know, how pivotal is it that A, Boeing is at this point finally to potentially launch in April and B, that they actually, you know, stick the landing, so to speak. Uh, Tim, we'll go to you first. I mean, it's hugely important for NASA. Um, they take, obviously, human spaceflight incredibly seriously. They wanted a reliable alternative to the Dragon from the beginning of this program, and it has taken many years to get to this point. I think they have been disappointed with Boeing. I think Boeing has been disappointed with the something like $900 million in losses they've taken on this program. Uh, and Boeing really needs us to succeed. If you haven't noticed, Boeing has been having a tough time basically across its business lines with engineering problems. And so if it could put some astronauts safely into orbit and bring them back again, that would be a major boon, even though the space business is something of a rounding error in its overall you know, profit numbers. Micah, not going to ask you to look into a crystal ball since none of us have one handy, I don't think. Uh, Magic 8-Ball will only get you so far. But, you know, you and your colleagues at the Wall Street Journal have, of course, done a number of reports on Boeing's various business ventures that uh, Tim was just mentioning there. Um, you know, how critical is it beyond just the space portfolio that Boeing get this right, you know, from a, an imaging perspective, as well as, you know, proving out their business case, not just for the ISS, but also to, you know, those commanding commercial space stations like, you know, Axiom, Sierra Space, um, you know, Blue Origin partnering together and the like. Well, I, I mean, look, this, as you guys both mentioned, there, this is human spaceflight. There's, there's really no, there's no room for error. I mean, the stakes are very high for this. It's, it's a long time coming. Um, you know, Boeing has faced real challenges, real struggles in other parts of the business, commercial aviation, some military programs. Um, and this is going to be a high profile event, right? I mean, um, you know, a, a lot of us in covering space, we watch all the, the launches. We're pretty aware of some of um, the relatively more esoteric it, it payloads, if you will. But, you know, the pub, yeah, I think the broader public tends to tune in a little bit more when when astronauts are involved. Um, so it's this is high stakes. It's a big deal. And um, what you know, what Starliner's future is, you know, outside of the, um, you know, NASA missions that it has committed to, um, that is, uh, that's something I think we'll be, we'll, we're all, we will also uh, be watching and kind of thinking about. 
Well, and unfortunately, uh, normally we would have this conversation last for an hour, but as we mentioned at the top of the program, we are expecting an update from Intuitive Machines and NASA on the IM-1 mission that's coming up in just about 15 or so minutes. So we're gonna go ahead and wrap things up now, but before we go ahead and let our guests go, wanna briefly give the mic back over to each of them in turn. Michael, we'll start with you and then we'll end with Tim. Briefly let folks know where they can follow your coverage and what do you have your eye on on the space beat coming up next week? Um, WSJ.com. Uh, I'm on X. I, I probably should post to LinkedIn and, 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 um, uh, Instagram more, but you know, uh, that's typically where you can find me. Um, next week. Good question. I'm just going to be plugging away on some kind of longer term projects, um, and getting ready for some upcoming conferences, the commercial satellite show, uh, in DC and, um, you know, Space Symposium is starting to loom, you know, in early April. And Tim, finally to you. Uh, yeah, you can follow me on Twitter, uh, at Tim Fernholtz. Uh, you can subscribe to the Payload Space newsletter, uh, which I contribute to on roughly a daily basis. And there's a lot of good work there. Um, and I have a Substack uh, under my name that you can find if you are so inclined. Uh, I'm glad I got the next week question second so that I could look at my calendar. And uh, I believe Rocket Lab is reporting earnings next week. Uh, I think they're a very interesting space company. I'm going to be intrigued to see what their results are and what we can expect from them coming up. Yeah, and certainly they've got an NROL mission that they just announced going off from uh, Wallops in about a month or so. so they've, they've got a lot on their plate as we all do here covering them. So Micah, Tim, thanks so much for joining the, the podcast here. Really appreciate your time, gentlemen. Great to be here. Thanks a lot, Will. And that'll do it for this week on News from the Press site. As mentioned, we're going to go ahead, wind things up and turn things over now to get ready for the IM1 news conference. If you want to follow along and watch that, we have that over on Launchpad Live. So you can check that out starting at 5 p.m. if it does start on time, but we'll be ready for it either way. I want to thank the folks behind the camera. Here we have our Steve Young, who is the editor of Space Flight Now, Adam Bernstein, normally running the tracking cameras for our live launch coverage, but running some of the technical aspects of the show as well. And most off, I want to thank you for spending part of your day with us, getting educated on a very busy week in space news. And you can bet your bottom dollar you'll join us right back here next Friday, where we'll have another robust conversation with some more fabulous guests. Look for that update and post on who those guests will be coming up next Thursday. For all of us here at Space Flight Now, I'm Will Robinson-Smith. Everyone have a wonderful weekend, and we will see you next time at Astra.